welcome this evening to our Bible talk on the heroes of the Old Testament. And today we have Elijah, the great prophet. A little bit of the background to his appearance. Now, according to the books of Kings, after the death of uh, King Solomon, the whole United Kingdom was uh, divided into the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. You see in the map, uh, the darker blue side is the Northern Kingdom and then uh, the lighter blue, you have Judah. And Judah have Jerusalem as the capital city, whereas uh, the Northern Kingdom uh, was centered on Samaria. The first king that ruled over the Northern Kingdom was uh, Jeroboam, and then of the South was uh, Rehoboam, both uh, sons of uh, Solomon. Now, just before Elijah came to the scene, Omri was king of Israel, the Northern Kingdom. And he continued the policies dating back from the reign of Jeroboam. Now, during the time of Jeroboam, he wanted his people to not go to Jerusalem to worship. Because uh, by doing that, he was afraid that his people would then be attracted to the kingdom of Judah. And so he set up temples and altars in the north, centered at uh, Shechem. His main intention, of course, was to uh, orientate uh, the religious focus away from Jerusalem so that the people will then had allegiance to his kingship. In that process, then he encouraged the buildings of uh, local temples, altars or sacrifices. He appointed priests from outside the family of uh, the Levites. Now, if you read uh, the Mosaic law, then uh, since the time of Moses, uh, the Levites were supposed to be the only group of people who would take on the priestly duty. Now, to rival that, then he had to appoint other priests outside of the family. And then also to allow the worship of Baal, uh, one of the most important deity uh, in ancient Canaanite religion. Omri, the king, achieved a domestic security uh, with a marriage alliance between his son Ahab and the princess Jezebel, a priestess of Baal, the daughter of the king of Sidon. Now we know that in, in ancient times, uh, that kind of political alliance um, uh, and the princess marrying the prince, uh, that kind of arrangement, in fact, occurred all over the world in, in different regions. That was for mainly political purpose. And these solutions uh, then brought security and economic prosperity to the Northern Kingdom, Israel, for the time. But of course, it was opposed by the Israelite prophets, mainly because of religious reason, uh, because with that then, uh, they worship uh, the other pagan deities. Under Ahab's kingship, he built a huge temple for Baal. And his wife, Jezebel, brought a large entourage of priests and prophets from Baal and Asherah into the country. And it was in that context that uh, Prophet Elijah appeared. 
and he was of course one of the major figure who opposed uh, the practices of King Ahab influenced by uh, the Queen Jezebel. Elijah warned Ahab that there would be years of catastrophic drought uh, because Ahab and his queen stood at the end of that line of kings of Israel who were said to have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now we have uh, explained to you earlier that uh, for the Israelites, they would interpret all events in life, whether natural or human, uh, as God's intervention in their life. And in this case where uh, we will listen afterwards, that there will be years of drought in that region. And Elijah interpreted that as a consequence of Ahab's infidelity to God. And Elijah's challenge to Ahab was very bold and direct. And he was saying that, that it, it is you and your pagan worship that is going to cause that catastrophe. And the link to that was because according to their understanding, the Canaanite god Baa was responsible for rain, thunder, lightning, and dew. So when Elijah announced the impending drought, he challenged not only Baa on behalf of God, but he was challenging the king, his queen Jezebel, and her priests. And that, of course, was not very pleasing to uh, his opponents. And because of that, then the king and, and the queen was going after Elijah. Elijah had to flee out of Israel, first to a hiding place by the brook Korath, east of the Jordan. And there, according to legend, he was fed by the ravens. And when the brook dries up, water dries up, God sent him to a widow living in the town of Zarephath. Uh, there's a P missing here, in a Phoenicia. That woman uh, offered him hospitality uh, from the little flour and oil that she had. After serving the prophet, she was telling the prophet that uh, after serving you, then our family might not have anything else left. Uh, we are prepared for hunger. But then Prophet Elijah assured her of God's providence. Using these words, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jar of oil will not fill until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. In that same occasion, when the prophet was uh, receiving hospitality from uh, this widow, suddenly the son died. And of course she was uh, mourning. And God listened to the voice of Elijah praying for the widow and her only son and managed to revive him, resurrect him. So Elijah was away almost for three years, hiding from Ahab and uh, Jezebel. Then he received a message from the Lord that he should now return to Ahab 
and to announce to him the end of the drought. So when Ahab came back, uh, I mean that when Elijah came back, King Ahab confronted him and uh, accused him of being a troublemaker. But Elijah told Ahab that he was the one who was the troublemaker. It was because of his sin that uh, God was using the drought to punish them. And his sin, of course, was to worship the false gods. Now, these are the words of Elijah. How long do you mean to hobble first on one leg, then on the other? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Ba, then follow him. Make your choice. Make your allegiance. Your, your, the, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. If you want to worship him, then worship him. If you want to worship Baal, then you are against the God of your ancestors. And in that confrontation, Elijah proposed a direct test of powers of Baal and the Jewish God. So people were gathered together, the people of Israel and 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah were all surmount to Mount Carmel for that ultimate test. An altar was built for Baal, another altar built for the God of Israelites. They put wood on the altars and an ox was slaughtered for both parties. Then Elijah asked the priest of Baal to pray for fire to light the sacrifice. Of course, they accepted the challenge so that huge number of uh, prophets and priests of uh, Baal started to pray from morning to noon, but without success. And Elijah ridiculed them. Hey, hello, what happened to your God? Eh? Is your God sleeping? Eh? Wake him up, eh? pray louder. And these priests, they responded by cutting themselves uh, and adding their blood to the sacrifice and continue to pray until evening time. But without success, no fire came. Then Elijah ordered that uh, the sacrifice on his altar be drenched with water. He prayed to God to accept the sacrifice and fire falls from the sky, consuming the sacrifice, the stones of the altar, the earth, in the, even the water drenched as well. So in that challenge, Elijah proved, or rather God proved himself to be the true God. Elijah felt justified and King Ahab had no choice but to accept that uh, the priests of Baal to be slain. Then Elijah prayed earnestly for rain to fall again on the land. And the rains began, signaling the end of the drought and famine. This was one very uh, important event uh, in the history of uh, the Israelites. And of course, Elijah was instrumental in kind of uh, uh, turning the attention of their people back to the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Jezebel was the one who brought in uh, the pagan worship and all the prophets and priests, of course, she was very angry and she threatened to kill Elijah. Elijah, on his part, then prophesied about Jezebel's death because of her sin. But to escape from the persecution, then Elijah once again uh, fled. And he fled to Beersheba in Judah, in the wilderness. 
but he was quite upset no uh, after so called proving uh, uh, his righteousness uh, and the god of uh, the jewish people was uh, greater than the baal yet he faced a persecution so he was very upset and and he he prayed that uh, must well i i die huh? he fell asleep and then when he was awoke he found food and drink uh, provided again god uh, showed that uh, he kept for him and to encourage him not to be upset and discouraged by being persecuted then elijah traveled for 40 days and 40 nights to mount horeb uh, supposed to be the mountain where moses had received the 10 commandments and he sought shelter in a cave still bitterly complaining of uh, the unfaithfulness of the israelites and the foolishness of ahab and the wickedness of jezebel by the way uh, the number 40 is a uh, very significant uh, we have uh, the israelites wandering the desert for 40 years you have elijah traveling 40 days and 40 nights to mount horeb and then uh, when the lord appeared he went uh, to the wilderness for retreat for 40 days and in the church we take on this number 40s during the season of Lent and there uh, at Mount Horeb um, Elijah was expecting the revelation of God first there was a terrible wind and then there was great earthquake and then a fire passed by but uh, elijah did not experience god in those phenomenon eventually in a gentle breeze uh, sent from damascus a gentle breeze occurred and uh, elijah heard a voice a sudden voice of god sending him uh, to Damascus to anoint Hazael as king of Aram, Yahu as king of Israel, and uh, Elisha as his successor. As mentioned by Shujan earlier, uh, that yeah, somehow it was in the stillness of the wind that uh, Elijah encountered God. In our life, we know that, of course, God is the one who takes initiatives. God is the one who reveals himself. And God can uh, manifest himself to us in many, many different ways. The important thing is our openness to God and being attentive uh, to his presence. In between, there was this story about uh, the vineyard of Nabok. Uh, Ahab desire. Uh, his vineyard and wanted to take possession of it offer to buy but then the uh, Nabot refused it, it was the, the 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 vineyard of his ancestors so the wicked queen Jezebel plotted uh, to acquire that land she sent in Ahab's name a letter to the elders and nobles uh, in the region of near uh, Nabov and to charge him of cursing God and using that uh, excuse to execute him to stone him to death we see here a parallel crime of uh, uh, King Ahab and uh, David uh, David wanted to uh, possess Bathsheba uh, and then sent his husband uh, Uriah the Hittite uh, into thick battle and got him killed. Uh, here it was the queen uh, Jezreel uh, who Jezebel who, who plotted the death of uh, Naboth. 
Elijah confronted Ahab for his crime and uh, prophesied that Ahab and his entire kingdom would be rejected by God and that uh, Jezebel would be eaten by dogs. Uh, but by the way, <laughs> just a slight remark here. Uh, Jezebel is a name uh, associated with this uh, wicked woman. Uh, uh, nowadays, uh, if you want to name your daughter, uh, sometimes people just take a name. Uh, they, they take a name that sounds nice and uh, not knowingly, uh, they may choose Jezebel as a name for the daughter. Uh, but, but don't do that uh, because Jezebel is not a saint. Uh, so uh, do not choose that name for your daughter. Anyway, when Ahab heard this, he was said to have repented to such a degree that God relented in punishing him. Instead, uh, God punished Jezebel. Eventually, uh, Jezebel died and yeah, literally she was uh, eaten by the dogs. And also uh, their sons, Ahaziah, uh, also died young. Of course, we say that uh, all these were interpretation of events uh, for uh, the Israelites. Uh, they always interpret events in a theological manner, uh, try to give theological explanations to all the happenings uh, in their life. For people like Ahab, of course, if he genuinely repented uh, that he receive forgiveness that was okay that fit our understanding of who God is uh, but from what we know of Ahab uh, probably he did not really repent uh, in that manner but they try to explain uh, why Ahab did not die young so they give the explanation that yeah because he genuinely uh, repented and therefore God did not punish him but instead God punished Jezebel and Ahaziah. Um, that was in a way a, a imposed interpretations on why Ahab lived longer. Uh, we, we don't have to accept that kind of uh, interpretations by ancient Israelites. Finally, uh, after fulfilling his mission, um, it was said that uh, a chariot of fire and horses appeared and Elijah was taken up to heaven. Uh, that was the legend uh, left behind by the, the Israelites. How true that is? Most probably not true. Huh? Uh, but as it was uh, described uh, in the book of Kings, then uh, his mantle fell to the ground and Elisha Pick it up and eventually uh, he became his successors and continued the mission of his master. Just some uh, remarks about the roles of the prophets. We know that uh, in the Old Testament, besides uh, Elijah, Elisha, there are formerly uh, four major prophets and 12 minor prophets. By the way, this word major does not mean that they are huge, great in, in, in a physical sense, but uh, that these four prophets, they have left this lengthy uh, writings. So if you read uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, we have chapters uh, written by then. So they are known as major prophets. And then we have what we call the minor prophets, immediately following uh, the major prophets, people like Hosea, Michal. Um, they are known as minor prophets because their, their writings are relatively uh, shorter. In fact, some of them just one chapter, two chapters, three chapters. And the role of the prophet is not about predicting the future. In our day-to-day -day usage, uh, sometimes we have that impression. Uh, to prophesy means to predict about the future. 
But in the Bible, the right understanding of prophet is not predicting the future, but rather speaking on behalf of God. So he would exercise the role of pulling and throwing down, destroying and building and planting the word of God in the people, as expressed in 1 Kings 18. Or sometimes it's expressed in this manner that the prophet admonishes, warns, directs, encourages, intercedes, teaches, counsels the leaders and the people. So he brings the word of God to them and calls them to response. So it can be a warning, you better change, you better repent. It may be an encouragement, do not be discouraged, the Lord is with you and so forth. Uh, so that is the pro prophetic mission. Essentially not about predicting the future, uh, but rather uh, building up the people, uh, uh, being the spokespersons on behalf of God. Now, some reflections and lessons that from Elijah in the light of the four Gospels. At the beginning of uh, the Synoptic Gospels, we have the appearance of John the Baptist. And his appearance, as well as his message, would kind of immediately remind us of Elijah. Because uh, John the Baptist preached the message of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Basically, that message of Elijah. Uh, and then he was persecuted by the king and the queen. In uh, John the Baptist's case, by Herod and Herodias. In the case of Elijah, it was Ahab and Jezebel. And Jesus himself identified Elijah as the spiritual successors, uh, that John is the spiritual successors of Elijah. If you are willing to accept it, he's Elijah who is to come. Anyway, uh, in the tradition of the Jewish people, they believe that uh, Elijah was taken up to heaven, but somehow he would come back again. And some people interpreted John the Baptist as uh, Elijah coming back. But Jesus is not saying that John the Baptist uh, is Elijah, but he's saying that John the Baptist has taken on the, the mission and the spirit of uh, Elijah. In uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, Paul cites Elijah's battle against the prophets of Baal as an example of God's grace for his faithful people. So, uh, if you are faithful to God, you are loyal uh, to, to God, wanting to fulfill His will, God will be with you. God will give you the necessary grace to overcome all adversities. And that's how uh, St. Paul says, Do you remember what Scripture says of Elijah? How he had complained to God about Israel's behaviour. Lord, they have killed your prophets and broken down your altars, and I only remain, and they want to kill me. What did God say to that? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bent the knee to Baal. Today the same thing has happened. There is a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul was making a kind of a parallel comparison of people who are faithful to God, referring to those who sided with uh, Prophet Elijah against uh, the worship of Baal. And in James, the letter of James, uh, it mentions that the heartfelt prayer of a good man works very powerfully. And James cited Elijah's prayer uh, as a prayer of a just man which started and ended the drought in Israel. Elijah himself never failed to pray, uh, especially in his distress. And his prayer was very spontaneous from his heart when he was uh, really down, downcast and upset and so forth. He cried to God, he, he lamented. He said, even God, uh, must well I die and so forth. Uh, but, but it was the prayer from his heart. And uh, James interpreted as that as a prayer of adjustment, as a good example for Christians 
to persevere in prayer and continue to trust in God and believing that uh, the prayer of the just man uh, is powerful. But of course, we know this is only a, a kind of a figurative way of saying eh? not so much the prayer of the man is powerful. It's God is the one who is benevolent. God is the one who uh, reaches out to us uh, to satisfy our needs and so forth. Uh, but from kind of a man's point of view, uh, we describe in that manner, but not literally so. Uh, it, the, the, the efficacies of our prayer is not so much about us and how powerful we are, uh, but it's about God and how loving and caring God is for us. In Matthew 10, 41, uh, there was a saying that anyone who welcomes a prophet will have a prophet's reward and anyone who welcomes a holy man will have a holy man's reward. So this text seems to remind us of the widow of Seraphath in a Phoenicia who offered hospitality to prophet Elijah and she was blessed with a sufficient provision and then the healing of her son. That seems to be the reward she received. But however, if we examine this verse in the context uh, of uh, Matthew 9 and 10, then we realize that uh, actually prior to this verse, Jesus was speaking about he as the cause of dissension and for the disciples need to carry their cross to follow him. So what is the prophet's reward? The prophet's reward is not uh, uh, food provisions, etc. But rather, the prophet's reward is to suffer opposition and persecutions. Uh, so it, in that context, then um, the disciples of Christ must be prepared to follow Christ and in that process even face the consequences of being persecuted and opposed uh, by the world, by the evil man. Anyway, uh, that is the tendency for us uh, uh, often to think of reward in the material terms. It doesn't mean that God cannot provide us uh, material things and material comfort, etc. But uh, as uh, prophets of God, uh, we must be prepared to uh, experience oppositions and to sacrifice for what is just and right. In the story of the transfiguration, uh, the Lord uh, was transfigured and he was radiant in light and glory. And uh, Elijah and Moses appeared. The disciples saw them talking to Jesus. And then there was a voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved, uh, referring to Jesus. Uh, listen to him. Um, of course, Moses uh, represented the law and Elijah the prophets. And But the coming of Jesus has transcended the law and the prophets. Now it is time to listen to Jesus and not to be too preoccupied with the Mosaic laws and also the teaching of the prophets. They had played their role, their roles in the Old Testament time. But with the coming of Christ, then uh, the disciples of Christ should listen to Jesus. And Jesus himself said that the righteousness of his disciples must uh, go beyond that of the scribes and 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 the Pharisees, which were based on the Mosaic law. Uh, just a side remark here, uh, during the crucifixion of Christ, uh, some onlookers uh, wonder if Elijah uh, would come to rescue Jesus. Jesus was crying out to the Father. And, uh, and that was because, uh, why, why was that such a remark? It was because uh, Elijah had entered into the folklore of the Jewish people as a rescuer of the Jews in distress. Uh, just as in our modern days, uh, uh, we believe that St. Jude is the patron saint of the desperate one. And, and for the Jews, they believe that Elijah uh, would come to the rescue of the desperate one. Uh, 
this is just uh, for for an interesting remark why uh, that was being mentioned uh, during the crucifixions so for today's uh, reflection uh, perhaps uh, you would like to reflect on uh, this topic through baptism we are called to be to play the prophetic role of announcing the word of god and to help people to return to god and guide them in his way how have you been exercising this role as the prophet of god